Perfect. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Albert Ahn, and I am very privileged to be the moderator for today's presentation, which is titled Feline Coronavirus and FIP Diagnosis and Prevention by Dr. Diane Addy. Dr. Addy is a veterinary virologist whose PhD and main focus of research is on feline coronavirus and feline infectious peritonitis. She is a former senior lecturer and head of diagnostic virology at the University of Glasgow Veterinary School and a member of the European Advisory Board of Cat Disease. She is also the author of www catvirus.com website and has channels on YouTube and BitChute. Her dream is to eradicate feline coronavirus and therefore FIP. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to have Dr. Addy please start her lecture. Dr. Addy? Thank you very much, Albert. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Um, along today and giving up an hour of your time to talk about this. Here is a word that you're probably all incredibly sick of hearing, coronavirus. People wonder why is it called coronavirus and why is the beer called corona beer? Is the virus perhaps called coronavirus because the nice little spikes that we see on the electron micrograph on the right look like a crown? Or is it more because on the left both make you feel terrible? I would like to ask you to, to do the poll question just now to find out who is here for feline infectious peritonitis, who is here for SARS-CoV-2, who is here for, to hear about both or for other reasons. Once a cat becomes infected with feline coronavirus, most cats, be, most cats are asymptomatic or show a little bit of diarrhea, although some, some cats can develop quite severe diarrhea. So, most cats become transiently infected, shedding virus, type 1 virus, for just a matter of weeks to months. But a small percentage, about 13%, becomes persistently infected without developing FIP. In this way, Feline coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2 are similar. The majority of infections are mild or completely subclinical. Feline coronavirus shedding is detected by reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR, of the faeces. Seroconversion to feline coronavirus occurs 18 to 21 days post-infection. The second possible sequelum to coronavirus infection of the cat is feline infectious peritonitis. Feline infectious peritonitis occurs in up to 10% of infected cats. Severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, according to, um, according to the Worldometer's figures uh, as of today, occur in only 2% of SARS-CoV-2 infected people. The previous, um, the closed cases, it's 13% of coronavirus infected people. We see a seasonality in both human and feline co uh, coronavirus infections in that both are worse in the winter months. And nobody really knows why. Feline infectious peritonitis is where we tend to step in, um, but bearing in mind that the majority of cats are, do not develop FIP. But FIP is obviously the manifestation that grabs our attention. Professor Mike Willard once said, a wrong diagnosis can be far more devastating than no diagnosis. And he was absolutely right in that. I hope to shortly produce a video um, entitled something like why did these cats diagnosed with FIP not ne need GS441524 which is the anti-nucleoside an analog which is sorry the nucleoside analog that Professor Peterson published 
last year as uh, being curative for FIP? And the answer is because most of, because the cats that I've just showed you did not have um, FIP, they had some other condition. 40% of cats that uh, come to my referral practice from referral practices uh, as diagnosed with FIP turn out not to have FIP and 80% of cats that have just gone to a primary practice with non um, diagnosed as having non-effusive FIP turn out to have some other condition. Well, what are these other conditions you're probably wondering? Many of them are toxoplasmosis or tumour and also we see a number who are misdiagnosed having really got bacterial pleurisy or peritonitis. The clinical signs are very varied, um, involving ataxia, uveitis, weight loss, failure to gain weight, gain weight, pleural effusion, abdominal effusion. There's a huge variety of presenting signs, which is what makes diagnosing FIP so very difficult. Doctors are also recording that SARS-CoV-2 is presenting in a number of ways. We haven't got time to go into the pathogenesis of feline infectious peritonitis, but it involves an immune mediated reaction and the perigranulomatous pyovasculitis, which is why it can present in so many ways. The outcome for the cats that you saw are that they mostly recovered when put onto the correct treatment or that they are in remission. Well, you're probably thinking, how on earth did these vets manage to misdiagnose these other cases as FIP? And rather shamefully, in some cases, uh, it was simply on raised globulins. Well, you all know that, that globulins will rise in any infection, bacterial or viral. So that's a very non-specific sign which should not be misdiagnosed as FIP. And in a number of other cases, FIP was diagnosed as uh, simply because the cats were seropositive for coronavirus antibodies. If you only remember one message from today, let it be a positive feline coronavirus antibody test is not diagnostic of FIP. We already saw at the outset that the majority of cats infected with coronavirus don't develop FIP. So how would you confirm that a cat has FIP? In effusive FIP, you would send the effusion for RT-PCR testing. And if it's positive, that's 96% specific for FIP. And for non-effusive or dry FIP, you would send a mesenteric lymph node fine needle aspirate for RT-PCR. And again, the specificity is 96%. Even if a laboratory asks you to send blood for RT-PCR, do not do so. The, the laboratory is mistaken. In um, Blood can be positive on a cat that's just in early viremia. So about 5% of positives will be false positive. But the main problem is that the vast majority of cats with FIP will be negative or virus RNA in their blood. Ruling out FIP diagnosis is relatively simple. In both cases, a negative coronavirus antibody test will rule out the diagnosis of FIP, provided it's sensitive enough. And here is the opposite message that you should always do a PCR, sorry, you should always do a coronavirus antibody test on blood, not on an effusion especially if you're using a lateral flow or rapid immunomigration in-house test. To take you back briefly to um, undergraduate level um, interpretation of FIP and coronavirus tests, or indeed any tests, sensitivity is the ability to detect a small amount of something. Specificity is the ability of that test to detect whatever it is correctly. For ruling out an FIP diagnosis or for um, doing screening tests, you want a sensitive test because you do not want false negative results. 
A few years ago, I did a test comparison of feline coronavirus antibody tests, and we published it in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery. It was part of my drive to eradicate feline coronavirus. And for that, I knew that people needed access to a sensitive and accurate feline coronavirus antibody test. I invited a number of laboratories and manufacturers of test kits to take part. And some of them replied. I gave people the option to not have their tests published if they wanted. I would simply give the results to them, to the manufacturers. So here, what you see really are the best of the best. You might be wondering why IDEX isn't a part of it, and they were invited, but they um, told me that they didn't have a feline coronavirus antibody test at that time. What you can see here is that two of the tests did exceptionally well, and one of them was the feline, feline coronavirus immunocomb, the ELISA test from BioGal. And this is the test here. I like this test because it, um, anybody can use it. You just store it in the fridge. But if you can see the, the little capillaries here on the left, I would advise you if you're using a lot of these tests to treat yourself to a proper uh, laboratory pipette um, and tips so that you can more quickly and very accurately measure five micrograms, sorry, five microliters of your sample to put into the little wells in the comb. This case here I want to tell you about. Um, this case was actually um, diagnosed as, as FIP pyogranuloma of the brain at a university a vet school clinic on the basis of the coronavirus antibodies, which turned out to be a false positive. And we asked the laboratory concerned to check the sample because it seemed incredibly unlikely due to the cat's history that the cat would have coronavirus antibodies. So this emphasizes that specificity of the test is also important um, along with sensitivity. You can download a feeling infectious peritonitis diagnosis flowchart from the catvirus.com website. You go to the downloads page, the free downloads, and find it there. Now, the guardians of this cat with the brain tumour had done that, and they had answered step one of the diagnosis algorithm and worked out that it seemed incredibly unlikely that their cat really would have FIP. Um, when you do the downloads, you will get this download for diagnosing wet FIP, this one for diagnosing dry FIP, this one for diagnosing coronavirus enteritis, which is a diagnosis of exclusion because there are so many causes of diarrhea in the cat, obviously and this same um, flowchart for interpreting um, RT-PCR tests and coronavirus antibody tests. Um, we don't have time to go into these charts in details, but if you um, subscribe to my YouTube channels, you will see the workings out of, um, of these algorithms with particular cases. Um, in does Pancho have FIP? Does Tommy have FIP? And there will be more of these series um, being made, being released. Uh, the links to those are in your notes. So um, this cat with the brain tumour was a 13-year-old cat who had been a street cat, i.e. a stray cat, who was rescued and brought in by some kindly people and he lived alone with them. So importantly, there was no opportunity to get infected with FIP. And one of the things people are tempted to miss when they look at this, these algorithms is the history. Um, and it's really important to find out, has the cat had an opportunity to become infected? Usually within the last two years, fairly recently. Um, and also we look for stress. Was the cat stressed recently? The incubation for effusive FIP is just 
weeks post-infection usually, not always. It can also occur um, a stress happening, such as a booster vaccination. So importantly, has the cat had an opportunity to become infected with coronavirus? Because if not, the cat cannot have FIP. This shows you a survival curve from my studies, my PhD studies. And on the y-axis, that is the vertical axis on the left, you can see the mortality at each um, time point, the time point being along the x-axis um, in months. And below the x-axis, you can see the number of cats uh, at each time point. The steps down on the survival curve indicate deaths to FIP. Therefore, you can see that it was most um, steep, that the curve was most steep during the first 18 months post-infection. In other words, cats were most likely to develop FIP within the first 18 months post-infection. Going out to three years, um, if a cat was three years post-infection, um, the chance of developing FIP was less than 5%. Now I'd like to put you all to the test. I'm going to launch um, a poll question in a moment. Based on this cat, this was a real case um, in Australia and the people contacted me the day before Misha was due to be put to sleep with FIP. Well, that's for you to decide. The history is that the cat is six years was six years old, indoor only, in a two cat household and the other cat was obtained three years previously. The cat presented with behavioural changes, anorexia, ataxia, a head tilt, weight loss, temperature of 38.9, so slightly but not hugely raised, and vision loss. Laboratory results included a coronavirus antibody teeter of 640, which is mildly elevated, an alpha-1 acid glycoprotein of 1,650 micrograms per mil, which is elevated, but alpha-1 acid glycoprotein is an acute phase protein which arises with all infections and is most useful in differentiating FIP from non-infectious conditions such as uh, tumours or, um, or diabetes and the albumin to globulin ratio was 0 0.45. So my question to you is, would you put Mishka to sleep? Please, Yotam, launch the poll. Your choices are yes, no, probably, or no, or um, you don't know. <laughs> We've got a very bright audience today, haven't we? They wouldn't put Misha to sleep, that's great news. I was just saying that she's clearly a pedigree cat. So she received a myringotomy under general anaesthetic um, and antibiotics, and she made a very good recovery. She never totally um, recovered from her head tilt. She always had a bit of a head tilt, but at least she was still alive. So her diagnosis, in fact, was inner and, mid and middle ear infection. Um, sorry, I was wrong, Albert. Uh, we are going to the, the, the um, questions for five minutes. People, you've only got exactly five minutes, but if we don't... I'm going to try to plow through as many of these questions uh, and those that we can't get to right now, we will take at the end. So, um, Diane, the first question is from Corina. Corina is asking you, how accurate is the albumin globulin ratio on a serum biochemistry panel as a blood test for FIP? That's a very good question. Thank you, Karina. Um, you, you specifically said on a blood test panel, well, um, if the cat is a suspect wet FIP, I would want to do the albumin to globulin ratio on the effusion rather than on the blood. In effusive FIP, what we have is a modified transudate. In other words, it's high in protein, but
but low in cellularity. So if you have a total protein on the fusion of less than 35 grams per litre, that would be 3.5 grams per deciliter if you're in America and measure it that way. If it's less than 3.535, then FIP is considerably less likely. Um, the albumin globulin ratio on either blood or the effusion of over 0 0.8 pretty much rules out FIP. If it's less than 0 0.4, then FIP is quite possible, but you would want to look at the effusion itself, the cellularity, um, and if possible, send the effusion for RT-PCR. If you have a non-effusive case, and say you've got an albumin globulin ratio of between 0.4 and 0.6, look at the albumin, because albumin goes down slightly in FIP, but not hugely, whereas say the, the differential was something like ascending cholangiohepatitis, then you might have a very low albumin um, measure and that will falsely, um, well not falsely, but it will alter the albumin to globulin ratio. I'm sorry, that was rather a long answer. Your great response. Is Great response, Diane. Uh, the next one is from Dr. Schechter. Dr. Schechter would like to ask you if there's any evidence of lymph edema, peripheral vascular disease, or venous insufficiency with feline coronavirus in your experience. That's a very interesting question. That's taken perhaps from the, the what we're seeing with the COVID-19 patients. I have a, a cartoon on YouTube, and it will be going on to BitChute, of the pathogenesis of FIP. And it's in some ways quite similar to the pathogenesis of COVID-19. And what you would see in it is the infected monocytes, the, the coronavirus infecting the monocytes, and then adhering to the endothelial cells. And so, um, that attracts an inflammatory response, which is what really causes FIP. Now, the, um, the, the organs that are being served by the arteriole that is affected by the FIP granuloma may then be compromised to such an extent that the cat presents with clinical signs um, due to, to, that, uh, to those lesions, the vascular lesions. So what we see tends not to be lymphedema exactly, but um, pyogranulomas of the, of the blood vessel concerned. Um, and it's rarely, it's rarely blood vessels going to the extremities. So we don't see swollen um, paws, for example. You're much more likely to see that in something like virulent systemic Khaleesi virus infection, or of course of nephrotic syndrome of the cat, or perhaps congestive cardiac failure. But what we get is destruction of the blood vessels to the peritoneum. And that's why you get the leakage of fluid into the abdominal cavity, known as effusive FIP, or, effus or leakage of, um, of plasma essentially, into the thoracic cavity, uh, presenting as thoracic FIP, effusive FIP. And we also see hydrocephalus of the brain, which could be due to leakage of the, um, the vascular um, supply to the brain, the meningeal vessels. So it's not exactly like COVID-19 because the receptors are different. Um, so in COVID-19, we're seeing predominantly um, problems related to the lungs because the ACE2 receptors are respiratory receptors. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Diane, one last question uh, before we resume uh, the presentation. Joy is asking you, this references back to your first response, if RT-PCR services are not available near 
the practitioner, what is your next best recommendation to diagnose FIP? Uh, she says that what they have been doing is to sometimes judge based on the presence of the classical signs of FIP associated or accompanied with the positive f cove result to diagnose the cat as FIP positive. And then she has one quick follow-up, which is, what is your opinion on steroidal treatment of FIP? Uh, she doesn't differentiate that question between dry versus wet form. <laughs> the second one's really easy and quick to answer. No steroids, no steroids. Um, and I've, I've done a 180 degree um, U-turn. So if you're looking at my older publications, uh, you know, Mia Kalpa, I've been saying use steroids. A couple of years ago, I realized that this wasn't a good idea and I changed over to meloxicam. So I would only use it if, if it was just palliative. If you've given up on the cat, you're trying to make the cat eat, um, and be more comfortable in, in the very last few days of life, sure, go ahead with the prednisolone. But if you really want to try to save the cat, then no, um, provided kidney function and blood pressure are um, adequate, then please um, use meloxicam instead, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Even if you can't get meloxicam, a quarter of an aspirin every two to three days um, is also um, an anti-inflammatory and it's cheap. But bear in mind the excretion of, of aspirin in the cat is very poor, so you mustn't give it more frequently than um, a couple of times a week. So if you didn't have access to RT-PCR testing, and I, I would like to mention that um, Glasgow University Veterinary Diagnostic Services do accept tests that are FedExed, samples rather, that are FedExed in from pretty much all over the world. So um, please do try to avail yourselves of that if you can. But if that really isn't an option um, and you sound like you're using the coronavirus antibody test, then if you go through the, um, the FIP diagnosis algorithms, step by step, you should be able to arrive at a, um, at a, a really pretty good idea of diagnosis, whether or not it's FIP. There are a lot of arrows to the left saying, no, this isn't FIP. Um, so you should be able to rule it out or rule it in um, using those steps very carefully. And as I mentioned, there are links in the notes to my videos regarding how I use them. In non-effusive FIP, um, I look in the eyes, I use an ophthalmoscope, and I'm not a very good ophthalmologist. So if I can spot changes, and I do, then you certainly can. Um, also, if you have just an ordinary, inexpensive light microscope, um, um, look at the effusion under the microscope. If there's an effusion there, look at that. If there are a lot of neutrophils, then you're dealing with bacterial peritonitis or pleurisy. It's not FIP. So there are simple inexpensive ways of uh, arriving at a diagnosis. Using your own eyes, your own hands to palpate the abdomen, see is the mesenteric lymph node enlarged. And you can get there um, if you're a reasonably experienced skilled clinician. Great. Uh, Diane, wonderful responses. Uh, let's get back to the presentation because I know you have a lot more stuff to share with us. <laughs> I'm afraid I do. So I wondered if we could prevent FIP by preventing infection with coronavirus infection. With Sorry, yes. If we could prevent FIP by preventing coronavirus. Coronavirus is shed in the feces and can last up to seven weeks um, in, in the environment of a cat litter tray because it's protected by the protein of the feces. Um, and by some cat litters, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I should also just mention that coronavirus, because of the spikes being protein and lipid, the 
the spikes are really quite fragile. So coronavirus um, that is shed outdoors, it lasts only minutes to hours, just as human coronavirus shed outdoors in the sun um, will rapidly be inactivated. Coronavirus transmission is fecal oral and mainly indirect. So a cat shares a litter tray with an infected cat and then grooms their paws and becomes infected. <clears throat> I wondered, could we prevent a coronavirus infection at the level of the litter tray? And last year we published a paper about the effect of cat litters on coronavirus infection in the laboratory on cell culture and also in cats. And what we found was that um, Fuller's earth-based, bentonite-based cat litters abrogated infection of cell culture. We worked with two very large multi-cat households in Denmark using only the best cat litters, i.e. Fuller's earth-based cat litters. And we found that Dr. Elsie Catatrack cat litter um, reduced but didn't completely abrogate coronavirus transmission. So you can use it to reduce the amount of, of um, infection, but not to completely get rid of it. Uh, we were dealing with incredibly large households, each of over 20 cats. Um, so if you can't get this kind of cat litter, which is probably only available in America. What we're looking for is lack of tracking. So you want a clumping cat litter and for it to be Fuller's Earth based. And we think that the Fuller's Earth um, ad, uh, binds the virus in some way. So we then wondered, could, trans could coronavirus transmission be prevented by stopping virus shedding? So um, intervening at an even earlier stage. And my colleague Cheryl Curran did that in her own ragdoll breeding category. She'd been trying various antivirals to see if she could stop coronavirus shedding. And I know that a number of cat breeders and rescuers have been trying various antivirals to see if they could get rid of coronavirus amongst their cats. And Cheryl got in touch with me very excited because she'd found that mutian bills uh, stopped coronavirus shedding. And these are the results um, at two mg per kilogram doses. So we started with a lower dose. And what we're, what we're seeing here on the graph is on the y-axis, that is the vertical axis, the coronavirus RT-PCR CT. CT stands for cycle threshold. And the CT is counterintuitive in that the lower the CT, the more virus there is. And along the x-axis um, is, is the time in days. And you can see that each of these lines corresponds to a different cat with different test time points. And there's the control period, and then at day zero, they received the short course of mutian and that most of the virus, most of the cats stopped shedding virus, but one of them didn't stop shedding virus. And she was in a small group with cat C6 in the red uh, lines and dots and reinfected cat C6. So after that time, we increased the dose to four milligrams per kilogram and that cleared the virus in all the cats. You can see cat C6 being redosed and um, stopping shedding virus. And in our, our um, publication, we reported on 29 cats um, in five households, which totaled altogether 50 cats um, and eradicating coronavirus from those households. Um, Mutian comes in three um, sizes. Between 200, 150. From our study, we got uh, we learned some things. First, it's essential to do it's essential to do a post-treatment fecal RT-PCR test to ensure that all of the cats are fully negative. Otherwise, a single missed cat will reinfect all of the other cats. 
Second, make sure that the faecal samples do not have cat litter on them because that can inhibit the PCR test. As we've already seen, uh, bentonite based cat litters bind the virus. And third, use a laboratory that reports virus quantity if you can and controls for faecal inhibitors. That last is very important and not, and not all laboratories do that. So again, because we're doing screening, it's essential that we have an RT-PCR test that is sensitive. Does stopping coronavirus shedding prevent a cat from developing FIP? Well, that's something that we don't know. We're following the coronavirus antibody teachers when available of the steps to establish the answer to this question. And just interestingly, as an aside, something we can learn from the doctors is that countries that use hydroxychloroquine for malaria prevention have fewer cases of COVID-19. Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with my style, my references are at the bottom of the page, but you will also see them in the notes if you're wanting to follow up uh, to confirm anything that I'm saying. So, a reducing coronavirus antibody titer indicates that there's no more virus in the body. And this is a useful thing to um, confirm that the cat really has recovered from coronavirus. We need a significantly reducing coronavirus antibody titer as evidence of recovery from FIP, i.e. Um, there, there will be variation, laboratory variation. Uh, in tests from one test to another very often. So I'd like to briefly tell you about Basil, who's a bit of an internet celebrity. He recovered from wet FIP and there are three other um, British short hair cats in his household, Bentley, Ashley and Natasha, um, and they were treated to stop them shedding coronavirus. Uh, Basil was kept isolated from them initially to stop him infecting them, but then we did the coronavirus antibody, sorry, the coronavirus PCR on their feces and found that they were all shedding virus. So they got treated to stop reinfecting him once he'd recovered from FIP. And in this graph, I show the antibody titers um, of these four cats in this one household. And you can see that they all started with very high titers of 1 to 80 or greater. At the Veterinary Diagnostic Services Laboratory in Glasgow, we stop uh, diluting the samples at 1 to 80 and we report them either as 1 to 80 or above 1 to 80 if they're still fluorescing very, very brightly at that level. So Basil probably had a coronavirus antibody titer in the tens of thousands. So in repeat tests, we're not seeing his level go down. He's the blue line going straight along at the top. But can I draw your attention to a cat called Ashley, who has um, the green uh, line and the little triangles. And you can see that over a 10 month period, um, Ashley's coronavirus peter decreased from 1 to 8 through 640. 320, 160 to 80, and that is a significant fall in antibody levels. And that gives us confidence that Ashley no longer has virus in her body. Um, you can see that all three of the in-contact cats have falling antibody titers. Now, it wouldn't be ethical for me to request that the people in my study deliberately bleed the cats um, for for research purposes. So what we say is if the cat is being bled for some reason, some health reason, and you have leftover blood, can we have it for coronavirus antibody testing? So gradually we're getting a little a trickle of those results coming in. And here are all these cats happily mixing together again. Um, they, it was safe to mix them again. We now have 10 households of cats that have, um, where mutian has been used to stop the cat shedding virus. So you can see that we now have 91 cats that have been treated. And the main reason is the same as it, it was for Basil's household. It's to prevent 
the reinfection of an empty cat who is recovering. In two households, the reason was because they had coronavirus associated diarrhea, so they were treated with mutian and made a nice recovery. And in two more households, uh, they, were, they were breeding households. And here you can see a nice litter of British short hair cats born after a household has eradicated coronavirus infection. And I'm getting feedback from the breeders that the kittens are just so different from when they had endemic coronavirus infection. You can see that these kittens are of nice even sizes, whereas coronavirus infected litters tend to be runty. And this is um, Cheryl's first litter born after she had become coronavirus negative. Um, they were all negative as well, not shedding coronavirus, not infected. But Cheryl was worried what would happen to them when they go out into the world, into their new homes. So she got a special import license. Um, she's based in the UK and brought in fellow cell FIP, the FIP vaccine, which can only be given at six weeks of age. That's why um, the kittens have to be kept coronavirus free until they're 16 weeks of age or else the vaccine won't work. I don't have time to talk in detail about the FIP vaccine, but I do have a video on it that you can watch. It's called The Truth About the FIP Vaccine. Fellow cell FIP is in an intranasal vaccine, a temperature sensitive mutant that only replicates in the cooler nares. Actually, this is not a photo of fellow cell being given, but one of um, a Bordetella vaccine being given intranasally. But on the right, you can see a thermal image of a cat's head showing the cooler nares. Now, what I wanted to mention to you was that previous FIP vaccine attempts had all failed because they resulted in antibody dependent enhancement and early death syndrome. And that's really very worrying in the context of the, the present pandemic, because there are um, similarities between human and cat coronaviruses. At present, prevention is, is by um, prevention of the disease is by trying to avoid infection. And other strategies include stopping virus shedding using drugs, i.e. mutian or chloroquine um, in cats and humans respectively. And as I've mentioned just now, the, F the fellow cell FIP vaccine is used um, to stop FIP developing and vaccination is being um, hugely promoted for SARS-CoV-2, but because of the similarities of pathogenesis of these diseases, in other words, they're immune mediated diseases, rather than simply diseases of the virus causing cytopathic effect, that could be very um, dangerous. So safety, um, there are safety concerns in both conditions. Um, they are the mortality is in in animals and humans that are in multi, um, multi cat, multi human environments. In other words, breeders, cat breeders, shelters, um, boarding catteries also, and in old folks' homes. Um, so they're both uh, conditions of immunosuppressed individuals. In other words, because kittens are very young, their immune systems aren't fully developed, and also they're stressed by a lot of. Um, uh, concurrent stresses such as being rehomed, being neutered, being vaccinated, and the humans can have comorbidities. In both coronaviruses, death is due to immune mediated pathology. Here on the left, we have the lungs of a SARS CoV 2 patient, and um, the, the reference is at the bottom. And on the right is a postmortem that I did of a thoracic FIP patient. And in both, you can see the fibrinogen plaques on the lung surfaces and in the cat also inside the pleural um, cavity on the pleurae. Min Cherry et al. published a paper in Nature Medicine in 2015, where they made a chimeric virus um, with coronavirus spike 
human laboratory. It, it, they used the SARS virus and they put in um, a, a receptor that would um, go on to the human, sorry, they put in a genetic code that would attach to human angiotensin converting enzyme receptors in the human respiratory system. And they importantly said both monoclonal antibody and vaccine approaches failed to neutralize and protect from infection with coronaviruses using, using the novel spike protein. So I think we need to pay very close attention to this because this is similar to the uh, attempts to make FIP vaccines using spike proteins. And um, not only did they fail to protect, but in cats they made matters a lot worse. And there are a lot of papers of, of, by scientists who have tried to make vaccines to the first SARS coronavirus, one virus that, um, that, that emerged some years ago, or to the MERS coronavirus. So to go back just a moment to Cheryl the ragdoll breeder, the coronavirus antibody test along with her FALV, FIV annual check. <clears throat> Key message here is to coronavirus antibody test kittens or cats prior to introduction into a household to prevent coronavirus introduction. And I've got a, a cartoon video of this that you can perhaps show in your waiting rooms. It's on uh, YouTube. And I've written a blog about it on the BioGal website. My main point being that introducing a pedigree kitten who has not been tested for coronavirus antibodies to your existing cats is playing Russian roulette with their lives. And similarly, cats and kittens from rescue shelters, anything that's infected with coronavirus, it could endanger your existing cats. And this, has, this sort of quarantining has been done on a country uh, level with the Falkland Islands where the vets realised that the cats of the Falkland Islands were all coronavirus negative and now insist on negative coronavirus antibody certification for coming in to that country. So again, because you're screening, you want uh, to have a sensitive test because you do not want false negative results. Um, and I'd like to just briefly finish with an appeal. Um, please contact David Lee, who's a veterinary student, if you would be willing to share uh, your practice records regarding F um, vaccination and FIP. Um, and his email is, is in the notes as well. And we're looking at wh what vaccines might trigger FIP. In other words, we want to investigate the stress, the effect of stress on FIP development. For more information, visit my website, catfires.com. For um, inf reliable information on SARS-CoV-2, um, go to the, the YouTube channel of Dr. Mike Hansen, I mean Hansen. And a big thank you. I'm blushing because my husband's sitting up there. Um, um, many thanks to Len Yotam and to Dr. Ahn for organising, sponsoring and chairing this webinar, and also to our friend Bertrand, who allowed me to use his office with a better internet supply than we have at home. A huge thanks especially to cat guardians who have allowed their cat stories and their samples and the results to be used for my research and for these stories, and to the vets, to yourselves. I couldn't do what I do without and veterinary surgeons in the field sending me samples and uh, and cases and a huge thanks to the CAPARS donors and subscribers who fund my research. Albert, back over to you. All right, this has been a truly spectacular presentation. Uh, Diane, there is no hope of answering all these questions. You have triggered an avalanche of questions and our commitment to uh, the audience members, uh, who are, by the way, raving about your presentation, is that we will follow up with each of them. Uh, but I think we have time to provide one answer or one question. Uh, 
This is actually from a friend of mine, Dr. Sally Haddock in New York City. She was wondering if you could clarify the one quarter of an aspirin dose that you mentioned earlier in the presentation. Uh, Sally is asking, is it a one quarter of a normal aspirin every two to three days or of an 81 milligram low dose aspirin tablet? That's a really good question. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, obviously, um, if it's the kitten that's being treated and some of these cat cats with FIP are very, very underweight. So the low dose one, if that's available, I was thinking about a cat of four to five kilograms normal size and the 300 milligram uh, tablet, which a quarter would mean 70 milligrams. But clearly, for a much smaller cat, you would want to go with a much lower dose. However, that would absolutely be my last resort if you couldn't use meloxicam and also things like Verbigen Omega, the feline interferon. Uh, and in closing, Diane, I just wanted to read one comment here from Jessica Cannon, which seems to capture the comments from about 50 of the people who have written in. Uh, she writes, excellent presentation. Thank you, Dr. Addy. So um, despite the technical glitches we had with the microphone, you really delivered a very powerful presentation. We thank you for the great job that you did. And for our global audience, thank you so much for joining us for this special BioGal webinar. We look forward to having many more in the future. Thank you all very much for attending. And thank you, Arnold, for being such a gracious and thorough host. Great. Take care, everyone.